Okay, it's 11 a.m. here on a Thursday. Welcome back to Chemistry 2330. Uh, we are hopefully recovering from our exam on Tuesday. Uh, I have all the grades updated through the, our homework for chapter 11 and the exam. There was a 12 point curve on the exam. And so we actually ended up with people above 100. So that was unusual, but the, uh, so you should be able to see that now in Canvas. Okay, so the class average was about right. The number of A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's is about right. So I guess we're going along just fine with this. Can't wait to get back in live in person. I'll be teaching this class in the summer, one, live and in person. And then I'll also be teaching in the fall as well, live and in person. So I'm really looking forward to that and getting to actually see your sleeping faces as opposed to just your names and sleeping behind your, your little name screen. So, all right. So that being said, let's go ahead and carry on. We only have a few chapters left. We have chapters 12 through 16, 11 through 16, and we're going to kind of run along, but there's a really common theme with chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15. Okay, and that common theme is we're going to introduce the good functional group called the carbonyl and all the different ways we can use it. So let's go ahead and share my screen and start looking at our slides for chapter 12. Share. All right, I'm going to move your shining faces over here. I was actually up early today. Well, not really that early, but you know, I had my uh, exam in one of my other classes today and it went really well. Yesterday I had to, I had horrible server problems. So we had to <laughs> reschedule it. But welcome back to our new thing, chapter 12. We're gonna talk about aldehydes and ketones, okay? So we've talked a lot about alkenes and alkynes and amines and alcohols and the different reactions they do. Well, now we're going to talk about the aldehydes and the ketones as our next functional group, okay? So specifically, the next few chapters, we're going to be talking all about the carbonyl group, the C double bond O, and that includes aldehydes and ketones, and I'll show you how to tell the difference between them. Carboxylic acids are taking off one of those groups and putting an OH on there. We're going to learn a little bit about their acidity and what causes its acidity. Then we're going to look at carboxylic acid derivatives, and that's all of chapter 14, how to go from one carboxylic acid derivative to the other and what their stabilities might be. And then we're also going to look at how the carbonyl affects the acidity of hydrogens on a carbon adjacent to it. That carbon one over from the carbonyl has, if it has a hydrogen on there, we can actually pull that hydrogen off, giving us an anion that we can use as a nucleophile. Okay. So let's talk about the structure of aldehydes and ketones. When you want to help the difference between an aldehyde and a ketone, look for a hydrogen bonded to the carbonyl. If there's a hydrogen bonded to the carbonyl, it's an aldehyde, okay? So the simplest aldehyde we have is what we call formaldehyde, which is this right here. But of course, the IUPAC name with an aldehyde, what we do is we drop the E at the end and add the word, add AL. So it'd be methane, Drop the E, AL, methanol, okay? And so if we had the ethyl group, that would be ethanol. Okay. Now, if we take that hydrogen off and put another bond to carbon, we now have a ketone, okay? So the simplest ketone we can have is these three carbons because the carbon of the carbonyl is one carbon and then you have to have two other carbons bonded to that carbonyl. So this is our simplest one and it would be propanone. And we'll talk about O-N-E as naming carboxylic acids, I'm sorry, naming ketones, but this actually has a really common name and it's known as acetone. Uh, you can buy that in the store. It's a really fast drying solvent. Um, you can buy it at Lowe's or you can actually, it's also used to remove uh, some kinds of fingernail polish. It's also used as a cleaner in some things. So it's actually fairly common and we can actually find it in your house. Okay, oops. That's not what I was trying to do, but hey, let's go. Okay, so let's talk about the structure of the carbonyl itself. Okay, so in this case, we have a carbon that is sp2 hybridized, so it has a p available. And the oxygen is sp2 hybridized, so it also has a p available. 
So the first bond in the carbonyl is this nice sigma bond with the hybridized orbitals. And then of course we have the pi bond above and below giving us our second bond, okay? So this gives us a couple things. Number one, it's a little bit more reactive than other things because we have this double bond to play with and we have polarity, okay? That's a polar bond, unlike an alkene where it's carbon to carbon, where that bond isn't very polar, we actually have oxygen, the more electronegative atom, and that gives our bond polarity. Okay, so when we talk about naming these, aldehydes are named, you can, it's easy to remember aldehyde because you drop the E and add AL. So if you had a uh, hexane, it'd be hexanal. If you had decane, it'd be decanal. That's by, just by adding an aldehyde. And note, because you have to have a hydrogen on that carbonyl, it's typically always at the end of the chain, okay? Now for the ketones, we have to do that, and it's easy to remember because in ketone, it has O-N-E at the end of it. We're gonna drop that E and add O-N-E for that. Now we want to also, when we're doing this, we wanna make sure we have the longest chain that contains the functional group, okay? So I'm gonna go over that a couple times. Now, if you have a double bond or a triple bond somewhere there, you still have to use that ene and ine for your infix. So you can have, you can actually have, um, you know, propene, propenal for the alkene would be the en, and then the al would be for the aldehyde, okay? Now, if you have a cyclic molecule like cyclohexane, and you have the, the aldehyde that has to be bonded to the ring. It can't be in the ring because we can only have one bond to carbon. So when you have it uh, hanging off the ring, it's called carbaldehyde. So we have cyclohexane carbaldehyde. Okay. If it's in a, if it's in the ring of a uh, thing, the actual own would stay in there, like cyclohexanone. Okay. I need to turn off those alerts. All right, so let's name a few things real quick. Okay, the first thing we wanna look at is this top row here. We see that those aldehydes are all at the end of the chain, okay? And if we're naming it for the aldehyde, that's the carbonyl carbon is our number one carbon, okay? So it's not ambiguous. We have to start with that, that carbon, okay? So if we look at that first, we have a total of one, two, three, four carbons in our longest chain and we have substitution. Because we're naming the molecule for aldehyde, we start with that as our number one, and we have butane, drop the E, add AL, butanal, and we have one substituent here, located on the three carbon, so it's three methyl butanal, okay? Now, I said if there is a double bond or a triple bond, we have to take that into account. So in this case, we have one, two, three, and we have two pro, Al. The other way to say that it would be pro two ene al, showing that the carbon, the first carbon of that double bond is starting on that number two carbon. Okay. Then if we have longer chains, we would just go ahead and add our substituents where they go. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have hexane right here, but we have two alkenes. I'm sorry, eight is octane. <laughs> sorry, octane, not hexane. Okay, so, but we have two alkenes, so we have to call it a diene, but we drop the ethene and add the AL for the um, aldehyde. So we have two, six octadiene al is our main chain, and then we have two substituents, one on the seven and one on the three. So that gives us, 37 methane, methyl, uh, dimethyl 26 octadiene. So then we have um, stereochemistry here. Uh, in this case here, we have this exact same group on here. So there's no stereochemistry for this double bond because we have, we can't set a priority over here, but we can on this because we have our priority one on this side. <laughs> our priority one on this side, giving us our opposite. So that means on our two, the, on our alkene beginning with that two carbon, 
we have the E configuration, okay? So it's all the same rules. We're just dropping 90 at the end and adding AL for the aldehyde. Okay, for rings, it makes it a little bit more fun. But when you're naming it for that rings, that's also your number one position. So in the case of the cyclopentacarboxaldehyde, you don't have to have any numbering. However, when you have a substituent on this one right here, you, because you're naming it for the carboxaldehyde, it always starts the numbering. So number one is on that attachment of that ring, making this 4-hydroxy cyclohexane carbaldehyde. And they happen to be on opposite sides of the ring from each other, so that gives us our trans 4-hydroxy cyclohexane carbaldehyde. Okay. So, um, so it's fairly straightforward. We're just adding a new rule to our system for changing it from an E to an AL. Let me see that aldehyde. Okay, so when we have ketones, uh, we have to name them for the ketone. All right, and in this case here, a common name would be, the, the, le the not common name would be, uh, okay, we have one, two, three carbons. So that'd be propanone. And so we would actually name this 1,3-dihydroxypropanone, uh, or the common name is dihydroxyacetone. Because remember, when we have just a methyl group on either side, this is called acetone. That's a C. Now, just like before, because we're changing the name, we have to identify where that uh, carbonyl is in the chain. And we want to put it at the lowest position possible. So in this case here, we have a total of one, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons right here. So that's going to give us a hexanone right here. But now we want to number it so that our ketone is lowest. Notice if we tr use the other rule, the first substituent would actually be lower if we started from this direction here. But the ketone takes priority, so we must label the ketone at the lowest number first, which gives us the three hexanone. And that makes our methyl group on that higher number, that five, which gives us our total name of 5-methyl, 3-hexanone. Okay. When we have the ketone in a ring, we can actually name that for the cyclo, whatever it is, and then put the O-N-E at the end. So in this case, we have cyclohexanone. But because we're naming it for that, that means this has to be number one which means our first substituent is on number two. So we have two methyl cyclohexanone. Okay, and then we have a couple other common ones that are kind of weird, okay? In this one, we call it acetophenone because this is the aceto group right here. And then this is a phenyl ring, but it's a ketone, so own. So acetophenone, okay? This is a flavorant used in a bunch of things, and I'm actually using it as a reagent in the lab uh, right now. Um, and it has a strong um, smell to it. Another way to think of it is if we have a ketone between two benzene rings, then we have benzo for the one side, phenyl for the other side, and own for the ketone. So benzophenone. And that's a common name that is used a lot in materials. Okay. Questions on nomenclatures of aldehyde and ketones. Make sure I'm not muted. All right, excellent. All right, so let's go on and talk about what if you have two, I mean, what, 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 let's talk about the priority of these things, okay? So we said before alkyl halides are never naming the structure and the ene and ine are all about the nature of the carbon and that's the infix, okay? So let's talk about increasing order of precedence of these things. So it turns out carboxylic acids are the highest priority. So if you have any carboxylic acid anywhere, you're going to name it for that. Okay. But aldehydes rank above ketones. Okay. So if you have an aldehyde above there, you have to worry about uh, if you have a, an aldehyde and a ketone, you're going to name it for the aldehyde. Okay. Then a ketone is a little below that, and then alcohols are below that. So if you have an alcohol and a ketone, you're gonna name it for the ketone, 
and use the prefix hydroxy for the OH. But if you have an aldehyde and you have a ketone, you're going to name it for the aldehyde. So it'd be aldehyde, but the ketone ha has a different prefix. If it's used as a substituent, we call it oxo. Okay. And aldehydes also use that same prefix of oxo. But when we tell them where the, um, where the oxo is, we can tell whether it has two carbons bonded to it or only one carbon bonded to it. And that's how we tell the difference between a substituent oxo as an aldehyde and a substituent oxo as a ketone. Okay, so let's look at a couple structures here and look at that order of priority here. So in this case right here, the thio is less priority than the alcohol, so we're naming it for the alcohol. So it'd be mercaptoethanol. The amine is lower priority than the alcohol, so we're going to name it for the alcohol. And we have amino propanol. Okay. But now once we go to a ketone, the ketone is higher priority. And so we have to name it for the ketone, having it on the lowest position, which makes our, our hydroxy at our four position. So because it's no longer an alcohol, we have to use the substituent name hydroxy. So it's four dash hydroxy dash two dash uh, butanone, because we have a total of four carbons in our main chain here. Now, if we take that compound and change it such that the end does not be hydroxy anymore, but is an aldehyde, we now name it for the aldehyde. So now we have butanal, but we have to locate that carbon, the carbonyl of the ketone. And so we have it three oxobutanal. Now, if we were to take that and change functional groups again and add a carboxylic acid, the aldehyde is now a lower priority group and becomes a substituent. And we name it for the carboxylic acid. So in this case, it would be three carbons. So it's propionic acid. And the oxo is where the aldehyde is. Note, you do not know whether it's an aldehyde or a ketone until you draw it out and see where if that, if that carbonyl has two carbons bonded to it or only one carbon bonded to it. So that oxo can be either an aldehyde or a ketone. All right, does everybody understand the priorities of the nomenclature groups here? This is also on the review that's on Canvas, so. All right, so unfortunately there are a lot of common names because we use them a lot in, um, uh, uh, the in, in, in engineering and, and chemicals and, and, and uh, just around the house. So we need to know a few of the common names that we have. So the simplest aldehyde I said was methanol, but its common name is formaldehyde. And you might notice because it's a carcinogenic uh, low boiling material. In fact, I think it's a gas at room temperature, but it's typically dissolved in water. Okay. Now, if we take that and convert one of those hydrogens to a OH group, that turns it into a, a carboxylic acid. And that's our simplest carboxylic acid we call formic acid right here. So if we move on to give it more something more like acetic acid, so if we, this had an OH here, that would be acetic acid. But because we have an aldehyde, we call it acid aldehyde. So acetyl acid aldehyde. And then of course, the carboxylic acid derivative is acetic acid or otherwise known as vinegar. For the ketones, when we name common ketones, we just name what the two different groups are if they're different or dye if they're the same. So in the case of this right here, this is a very common solvent called meek methyl ethyl ketone. Okay. Notice that this is an engineering name and does not follow the alphabetization rules but it makes a cute little name when you run it all together and say meek, so that's why it's done that way. If you have two ethyl groups here, that'd be diethyl ketone. And again, two of the same groups here of dicyclo, making it dicyclo, cyclohexyl ketone. Okay, so the common names are pretty easy, and the common names for the aldehydes are, of course, are derived from their carboxylic acid derivative. The ketones are just what groups are bonded to the carbonyl. Okay. So I said before, when we were looking at this carbonyl, that we had a very reactive bond. 
okay? Because we have a double bond. We have those lone pairs, of, uh, that lone pair above and below the plane. And so that's giving it some activity. But I said we had also had a polar bond, okay? That polar bond is what gives it its properties, including reactivity and the fact that it can form dipole-dipole interactions. So let's pull that up a little bit. Because the oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, it's pulling electron density that way, meaning the carbon of the carbonyl has a partially positive charge. And the oxygen of the carbonyl has a partially negative charge. Okay. So if we were to draw a resonant structure of that, where we are going to start with our double bond here, if we moved the electrons up to give the oxygen all of the electrons, it would have a negative charge. And we'd end up with a positive charge on carbon. Now, between two, this is the more stable of the resonance hybrid. This is the more, uh, it stays there more often, but because this is a valid resonance hybrid structure, that means we do end up with some positive charge on that carbon, which gives rise to this polarity we see in the carbonyl carbon, okay? And if we look at that by electrostatics here, that means that we have a net dipole going in this direction where the carbon has a, the carbon side of the aldehyde or ketone has that partially positive charge and the oxygen has the partially negative charge, which means when it interacts with another uh, carbonyl compound, it's gonna interact in a way such that the partially positive side is going to bond to the partially negative side of the adjacent atom. And that gives rise to that dipole-dipole interaction. Now, dipole-dipole interactions are not as strong as hydrogen bonding interactions, but they are stronger than van der Waals. So what we see is they have a greater effect on the boiling points than regular hydrocarbons, but not as much as in alcohols or carboxylic acids. Okay, okay. So let's look, take a look at those physical properties and, and take a look, changing the functional groups and looking at those dipole-dipole interactions. Okay, so in the case of diethyl ether, we have a small dipole-dipole interaction with the oxygen here in the middle, but one of the dominant forces is the van der Waals forces of the, of the ethyl groups, okay? And so in that, if that's our dominant group, if we compare it to heck pentane right here, they have about the same boiling point for about the same molecular weight. So molecular weight gives it some of its mass, and then that van der Waals forces gives it the rest of that increase in boiling point. Just by changing the last group to an aldehyde, trying to keep the same mass right here, we now have a dipole-dipole interaction, and we double the boiling point. Okay. Now, if we to it with a carbonyl, I mean, with a ketone instead of an aldehyde, we still get that dipole-dipole interaction. That dipole-dipole interaction has increased our boiling point. But let's go to something that has a hydrogen bonder here. It's much higher. So see, the effect is not, uh, it's somewhat in between van der Waals forces and hydrogen bonding forces as to where their boiling points might lie. And then of course, carboxylic acids can do a lot of different hydrogen bonding and therefore it's even higher. All right. So what this dipole-dipole interaction can do also is help it be soluble in water until you have too many carbons, okay? So the dipole in the, in the general rule of thumb was one alcohol OH can pull four carbons into water, okay? There's not as strong a bond. So it looks like we can only pull three carbons into water. And then once we get above that, it gets really, really hard to do, okay? So let's look at that comparison here. In formaldehyde, we only have one carbon. We have a dipole-dipole interaction and it can, and it can uh, interact with the water, and it's infinitely soluble, completely soluble in water, okay? By adding the one carbon there, we still are being, that dipole-dipole interaction is still being able to pull in all of those, the, both the carbonyl carbon and the methyl group, okay? And then once we add that one more carbon here, it starts losing its solubility. 
Okay. And then by the time we add another carbon here, well, this is the hex, uh, two carbons actually, it's barely soluble at all. So you might get a few molecules in there. Now, ketones are very similar in the fact we can get about three uh, uh, carbonyl, I'm sorry, a three carbon uh, ketone into water. But once you go up to the four carbons or the, uh, the five carbon here, these are increasingly less and less soluble in water. Okay, so we have a dipole interaction and we have a water which has a dipole as well, but it also has hydration bonds. Okay. All right. Um, Good question. Yes. So you said that the general limit is that it's very soluble until you add more than four carbons? It's pretty soluble until you have three or more carbons. Okay, three or more. Thank you. So notice acetone has three carbons and it's completely soluble. Uh, acid aldehyde has two carbons, it's completely soluble, but propanaldehyde is, is so a little bit soluble, but not as much. All right, so let's talk about some reactions. I said that when we look at these reactions here, we have a polar bond, okay? We have a polar bond that's active because of that. Uh, it has a double bond that has electrons out here, makes it reactive. And then we have polarity that makes it reactive, okay? So what that means is that we're gonna have a reaction can either attack the partially negative side of the molecule or the partially positive side of the molecule. So if we have a negatively charged nucleophile, it will always attack the carbonyl carbon to give us a, an addition product, which will give us an intermediate or final product that'll have changed the hybridization from sp2 to sp3. And when you do that, that means you have a tetrahedral structure on there. Now, this might go back and do some other chemistry and go back to an sp2, or it might be done with the reaction and stay that sp3. But the intermediate is always the nucleophile comes in. We end up with four bonds to carbon right here. And the oxygen takes the negative charge of there because the two electrons from the double bond move up to the oxygen. And that new sigma bond is from the electrons from the nucleophile. Okay. And remember, nucleophiles are things with negative charges or lone pairs that like to attack partially positive or positive materials, which are uh, electrophiles. Okay. So does that make sense that it would kind of do that? Because that's the partially positive side of the carbon here. Okay. So now I want to talk about a very strong nucleophile in which we are going to take an alkyl halide and we're going to convert it into a carbon with, an, with, a, with a partial and negative charge on there. So we can use that partially negative charge on carbon to act as a nucleophile. Okay. This was originally studied in, um, I wanna say France, but I think it might've been Germany. And he actually was able to get a Nobel prize for this by looking at an interaction between a simple metal, in this case, magnesium, and an alkyl halide like, uh, you know, bromopentane, okay. So let's look at how we make these reagents. Okay, the general form of this reagent is some kind of R group, which is anything. So let's do a propyl there and a magnesium. And then attached to the magnesium is a halogen, in this case, bromine. So all green reagents look like a carbon chain with a magnesium and some halogen attached to it. Okay, and we can make them either alkyl or aryl. As long as there's a as long as there's a halogen there, we can make this. All right. So, how do we prepare it? Well, the cool thing is that magnesium is reactive enough to insert itself in between the carbon and the halogen bond by undergoing a two electron oxidation. So notice we're starting with magnesium zero here, but this is magnesium plus two. So it has lost two electrons. And what it's basically doing is putting an electron in to the, 
to the bond with bromine and an electron into the bond with carbon. So there's one electron in here. There's two electrons in this bond. So it's gonna end up inserting itself in that bond and giving up those two electrons to give it a positive charge. Okay. So it does that with either alkyl groups or phenyl groups and you just have to uh, have the magnesium by itself and a solvent. Typically we use diethyl ether uh, as the solvent. So you'll see this magnesium and ether to form a Grignard reagent. Now we have the Grignard reagent, which is a good nucleophile. Okay, so I said there's a partially negative charge there. And the reason there is, is if we looked at the electronegativity of carbon and magnesium, carbon is more electronegative. Up to now, most of the time, the, uh, whatever was bonded to carbon was more electronegative than carbon. This is the first time we've actually had the carbon be more electronegative, which means when we have that, because we have this polar bond, it's greater than 0.9, so it's a polar bond. I'm sorry, greater than 0.5. We have now a partially uh, delta negative charge and a partial positive charge on magnesium. That's what gives it its reactivity here. We're not taking a whole negative charge and putting it on carbon. We're stabilizing it in a polar bond. Okay. So if we had a whole negative uh, charge on carbon, that would be a carbanion or an anion on which the carbon has a pair of unshared electrons. It's still sp3 hybridized, but it has two electrons in that sp3 orbital. Okay. So if it were to dissociate, you would leave the negative charge on carbon and have the positive charge on magnesium. Okay. So now that we can think of that as maybe a, 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 a partial state that we might be able to use it in, we now have carbon is our nucleophile. So this is new. This is instead of having a nucleophile that would come and do other reactions, we can actually do a carbon-carbon bond directly with the system using this Grignard reagent. Okay, so now because this Grignard reagent is kind of backwards from the other thing we've done before, we have to be careful about what we do the, react, the, the reaction in. Because the uh, negative charge on the carbon makes it a very strong base because when we put a hydrogen on there, we look at the pKa of the thing with the hydrogen on there, and that's one of our weakest acids. The alkyl groups are very, very weak acids. And so that means that our, uh, our, our uh, Grignard reagent is going to react with anything it can pull a hydrogen off of. So that means it's going to react with anything with an OH group or anything with a more acidic hydrogen than it has. Okay, so for example, an alkene or an alkyne. So we have to be careful not to have water, alcohols, carboxylic acids, amines, thiols, or even alkynes if they have a terminal hydrogen because the Grignard reagent has a much, much stronger base and will pull that hydrogen off and inactivate itself. Because once it pulls it off, it turns itself into a hydrocarbon and that hydrocarbon is now not reactive. Okay. So because of this, we have to think about exactly which solutions we can make these in. So we can't use alcohols because again, that has about the same pKa as water. And so it would definitely react with us as well. So that's why we use that special, uh, we use an ether, diethyl ether in particular, and because it does not have any acidic hydrogens. Okay. So let's figure out what we can make with this. Okay, so we've made a nucleophile. We've made a carbon with a partially negative charge on there. The carbonyl has a partially positive charge. So that means we're gonna make a carbon-carbon bond when we react a Grignard reagent with either an aldehyde or a ketone. Okay. When we do that, we're gonna open that up and we're gonna generate alcohols. So I'm gonna show you how to generate a 
primary alcohol, a secondary alcohol, or a tertiary alcohol using a Grignard reagent and an aldehyde or a ketone. So to make a primary alcohol, we must use formaldehyde, okay? So let's look at that reaction in detail. We have our partially negative charge here. We have our partially positive charge here. We have our partially positive charge here and our partially negative charge here. So we're gonna have this carbon come in and attack this carbon to give us our tetrahedral intermediate. Notice we have the two hydrogens are still on there and the negative charge now resides on the oxygen. And that negative charge is counterbalanced by that magnesium and the bromine. Remember the magnesium is a plus two. So it has a negative charge from the oxygen for one of them and a negative charge on the bromine for the second one. And therefore this makes a, a nice stable salt. Okay. Now, if we, when we work up the reaction, we have to add some kind of acid to it to get rid of this magnesium complex and we generate a primary alcohol. Okay. See, these two hydrogens on the formaldehyde makes it the only way to get a primary alcohol. We have to use formaldehyde because we need two hydrogens on there and only one new carbon-carbon bond. Okay. So if we can make a primary alcohol with a, an aldehyde, I think we can make a secondary alcohol with an aldehyde too, okay? But it can be an aldehyde that does have at least one carbon bond. We're gonna be making one new carbon bond with the Grignard reagent, and it has to have a carbon bond on itself, and it has to have a hydrogen. So it has to be an aldehyde, and it has to have some other R group on there. When we attack it with the Grignard reagent, we will generate a secondary alcohol. So let's look at uh, this. Any other alcohol, I mean, any other aldehyde other than formaldehyde will form that secondary because we have something attached to it. Our partially negative charge here, partially negative, let me erase that. And partially negative charge is going to attack our partially positive carbonyl here, giving us our intermediate complex. So when you see Grignard reagents, you'll sit, we see them use a water or acid at the end. When you have acid at the end, it breaks up that complex and gives us our final complex. Now notice this is a secondary because we have one hydrogen on here that was the aldehyde hydrogen. And then we have the two bonds to carbon. One was already on the aldehyde and one is the new one we generated with the attack by the Grignard reagent. Okay. So a formaldehyde gives a primary alcohol and an aldehyde gives a secondary alcohol. All other aldehydes give secondary alcohols. What if you attack the ketone? Ketone already has two bonds to carbon, but it has a carbonyl. So if we attack that carbonyl with a nucleophile or a Grignard reagent, we should generate a tertiary alcohol, okay? So we already have one bond to carbon here. We have two bonds to carbon. And then by the time we generate this next bond here, we now have three bonds to carbon, making it a tertiary alcohol. But of course, it's not the free alcohol until we work it up with a little bit of acid to generate our final pro product, okay? So does that make sense? You know, we have that partially negative carbon attacking a partially positive carbon to make a new carbon-carbon bond. And we've converted from our sp2 hybridized trigonal planar structure to our sp3 hybridized tetrahedral structure, okay? So let's figure out three different ways to make this alcohol, okay? So three different ways to make that, okay? So you're saying, well, isn't there just one way to make it? Well, no, because it all depends on which compound, which of these bonds was made by the Grignard reagent and which of those bonds were found in the ketone, okay? So let's go ahead and pull up my blank page here. And let's draw our structure. Our structure is a phenyl ring, oops, an alcohol, an ethyl group, and a methyl group. Okay. 
So I think we can do three different reagents to make this exact same compound, okay? So the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna number these one and two and three, and we're gonna take, we're gonna make each of those bonds, one and two and three with a different Grignard reagent, okay? So if we were to take this compound, I'm gonna draw it real big right now. OH, and say we're gonna make the Grignard reagent attack here first. That means this has to be the Grignard reagent and it would look like MGBR. But what would the other half of the molecule look like? Let's see, we would have these electrons kick in here and we would have a ketone with a methyl and an ethyl group on it. So by breaking bond number one, we can go backwards and look at the Grignard reagent had to be on the phenyl ring and the ketone had to contain the methyl and the ethyl. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's look at that again, but let's not break that number one bond Let's break the number two bond here. If we break that number two bond, that means we had CH3 MGBR because you're creating that new bond between the methyl group and that carbonyl. And that turns the carbonyl, and when we kick these electrons in, into a ketone with a phenyl group and an ethyl group on it. So that's our second way, because we're using a different Grignard reagent than we used here. We're using a different ketone than we used here. So that's our second way. So let's go ahead and break our third bond right here. And if we break our third bond here, that means we had to have an ethyl Grignard because we have this ethyl group as our third bond, plus our phenyl ring on one side and our methyl group on the other. And this is one of those common ones called acetophenone. Okay, so we've been able to use three different starting materials to make the exact same compound. Oops. Okay, now notice it's the same reaction, it's the same mechanism. All we did was choose which one was going to be our Grignard reagent and which one was going to be our ketone. And if we had a secondaries, we could do the same thing with our aldehydes as well. At least you, 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 don't, you won't have as many choices because you have to have at least one of the aldehydes, but you'd have two different choices to make that secondary. All right, so let's head back to our thing here. All right. Okay, so we just showed you how to synthesize three different tertiary alcohols using three different Grignard reagents and three different ketones. All right, so what's the other thing we can do? Okay, what's the other thing we can do with a carbonyl? Well, the other thing we can do with a carbonyl is we don't have to attack that carbonyl with a strong nucleophile. We can actually attack it with a weak nucleophile. And when we looked at nucleophiles, we had weak nucleophiles like water and alcohol, okay? So it has a lone pair on it, which is why it's a nucleophile. And when it bonds, it will give us a reversible reaction. Okay. So in this case here, we're gonna have our lone pair on one of these two lone pairs on here is going to attack this. That's gonna kick this hydrogen up and then this hydrogen will get transferred over to the oxygen there. And we make what we call a hemiacetal. Okay, so it's an acetal, but it's only has it's a hemiacetal because we have an OH group and an ether group. If you have an OH plus an COC bond, that's a hemiacetal, okay? Now, if we get rid of that OH and put another alcohol on there or another ether linkage on there, that's actually called an acetal. So hemi means half, and an acetal would have two of those ether linkages. A hemiacetal only has one of those ether linkages and an OH. Okay, so in, you can actually react almost any alcohol reversibly with 
any aldehyde or ketone to make an acetal. Okay. So it's really cool is that if you have an alcohol on one end of your chain and an aldehyde or ketone on the other end of your chain, as long as you can make a five or six membered ring, you can form the cyclic hemiacetal. Notice we're doing the same thing. We're using this as our nucleophile. Oops. We're using this as our nucleophile. It's going to come in here. So the first thing we have to do is get it in the right position so the, these lone pairs can make a new bond. And then we'll transfer the hydrogen over to here. And we've made that linkage again. So remember, we have this ether linkage and we have the OH to form our hemi acetal. Mm. Trying to get so it. the idea behind the hemi hemiacetals are if they basically can undo like they, they can reform rings, correct? Well, they can form rings, or they don't have to form rings. See the one on the top here? It's a reversible reaction that removes the carbonyl. So if you wanted to do a reaction and the carbonyl is going to interfere with it, you could turn it into a hemiacetal, and then the carbonyl won't react like a carbonyl anymore. And I'll, I'll, let me drive that home when we do the next page here, okay? Okay, so if we take that and we react it with a second equivalent of an alcohol. Dr. Irving, can I ask you a really quick question before you go forward? Um, so with that last one, is, is that the same concept as when sugars form rings? Um, actually, yes, the, that, that okay. same reaction is used to make the sugars form rings. So if you look at uh, individual sugars, they either have ketones or aldehydes at the ends, and then they react with an alcohol in the next sugar. So yes, that is a good analogy. Okay, so if we take off that OH, we get to be what we call a full acetal, uh, no pun intended. Anyway, so what, but what that does for us is that makes it not have an OH group, okay? So in the case of the hemiacetal, we have an OH group, so we wouldn't be able to use it for certain reactions right here. But in this case, we have two ethers and no hydrogen bonding hydrogen. So this is a much more stable species. Okay? So we have two of those ether linkages and no OH. So that's the acetal. Okay. Now, why do we care? Okay, Why do we care is because we want to be able to take away the reactivity of that carbonyl and turn it into something less reactive. So in the case of making the acetal, we have to lose water, okay? But water is a, OH is a horrible leaving group. We have to lose that OH, but OH is a horrible leaving group. So what we're going to use, we're going to use acid as a catalyst and create the protonated alcohol which gives us now a good leaving group. Water is a good leaving group now. So when we have that happen, uh, we now have a good leaving group. We can have the electrons from the lone pair of the oxygen kick in and temporarily form this stabilized cation. It's partially on the oxygen, partially on the carbon. And now we can have the lone pair from another alcohol come in and attack that partially positive charge on that carbon here, and then it will create the protonated acetal. And then of course, whatever uh, base you have, uh, whatever counter ion you have there will act as a base. You'll regenerate your acid and you now have two ether linkages right here. Notice that we went from something that had a partially positive carbon to something that now has a neutral carbon, okay? It has two bonds to it, and it no longer can act as an, as an aldehyde or a ketone. Okay. Now, these reactions are in an equilibrium. If you, have, if you are removing water as you go forward, you're going to drive it to the acetal. If you add water to the reaction, you'll drive it back to its starting material. The, either the aldehyde, ketone, or hemiacetal. Okay, so that can be kind of useful, but they're not really all that stable in these long chains. But when you make a cyclic acetal, they can be very, very stable and very useful. Okay, so how do we make a cyclic acetal is 
we take a diol or something with two alcohols on the same compound, and when they both form, to, uh, they're, we're going to end up forming a ring. Okay, and these tend to be much more stable. So in this case here, we'll have our first one react on this side, and that'll give us our hemiacetal. Then we'll have our second one react on the other side to give us our full acetal. And so what that would look like would be a nice five-membered ring. Okay. Now, if we have a if we have a longer chain, like maybe a propane, it would form a six-membered ring. But we can also do something really cool with this one right here. It will form on there. One and will attack the first side right here. The second will attack the other side. And what we'll end up with is another five-membered ring with a six-membered ring attached to it. Okay. Now, when we do this reaction, this is a cyclic acetal. The cyclic acetals are more stable and are more synthetically useful. Okay. So I said that when we go from the ketone or aldehyde to an acetal, it makes it less reactive as a carbonyl compound. Okay. So let's look at that as a way to protect the carbonyl. So let's say we wanted to do a Grignard reaction and we had a couple different places it could attack, but we didn't want it to, we wanted to have a ketone in our final product. So that means we couldn't have used it. We couldn't have that ketone in the starting material. So let's look at a way of making that carbonyl less reactive. Okay, so for example, Let's say you wanted to make this compound here and you wanted to use a Grignard reaction. Okay. So if you were to just take it and use a Grignard, take this and add it to magnesium, right here, it would form the Grignard reaction here, but then it would react with itself. It would attack its own aldehyde and you would not be able to react it with the other thing you wanted to react with. Okay. So it would attack itself. Okay. So in this case here, we want to deactivate this carbonyl just for the reaction we're going to do, which is the Grignard, and make it react with some other carbonyl. So that's why we're going to use the acetal, specifically the cyclic acetal. So in this case here, what we do is we use a little acid, a diol, and the diol is only going to react with the carbonyl of this aldehyde to form this cyclic acetal, okay? Now we can make the Grignard here because it won't attack itself. We don't have a carbonyl there anymore. So we can make the Grignard here and then use it to attack the aldehyde we want to attack to make our product. And at the end of the reaction, all we have to do is add water and acid and that'll break off the acetal, regenerating our aldehyde. So we can use it as a way to deactivate one carbonyl so we can do a reaction on a different carbonyl and then regenerate it by adding acid and water at the end. Okay. Does that make sense? So, because we don't have that partially positive carbon anymore, so we can not attack it with our granular green. Okay. So in that case, the entire step would be we make our cyclic acetal. Then we can make our Grignard reagent, which will be nice and stable until we add some other carbonyl compound. Once we added some other carbonyl compound, it's going to act as a nucleophile and react to that carbonyl compound to give us our salt intermediate. And then to get rid of the salt, we're going to add acid anyway. So when we add acid and water, it gets rid of the salt and regenerates our aldehyde at the same time. Okay. So we make our acetal, we do our Grignard, and then we work up our Grignard and it regenerates our carbonyl compound. Pretty cool, right? So we can use that reactivity of the carbonyl to protect it and then regenerate it just by adding more water and acid. Okay, questions on that? So there's a lot of chemistry in this, in this chapter. We learned about Grignard reagents and the fact that we now have a carbon as a nucleophile. 
We've learned about aldehydes and ketones as their functionality, and we can make hemiacetals, which have an OH on them, or full acetals, which have two ethers on them, and why we would want to make a full, an acetal. Okay. So the other thing we can do with this is because nitrogen is more nucleophilic than oxygen, uh, it can form a reaction where it takes uh, the nitrogen and it reacts with the carbon and, and give us off water. Okay? And that creates a new carbon nitrogen double bond called an imine, imine. Not an amine, an amine is what we're starting with here, right here with the nitrogen and two hydrogens on it. So we're making the nitrogen double bonded. So we have an imine, okay? So in the case of this, we can take any um, ketone, preferably ketone or aldehyde and react it with any nitrogen that has at least two hydrogens on it, okay? It has to have at least two hydrogens because we're going to donate two of those hydrogens and uh, to the oxygen to make it turn into water. Uh, what, how does water and acid regenerate? Oh, the water doesn't, oh, regenerate the, the carbonyl? Okay, because the react, uh, sorry, I have a question in the chat. Because this, forming this uh, acetal, it's a reversible reaction. We drove it to make the, the acetal by removing water from the reaction, okay? Now, if we go the other way and add a little acid and add more water, it's gonna drive that reversible reaction back to our carbonyl compound. So if you add excess water and acid, it'll drive it back to the carbonyl compound because when we looked at the basic reaction here, up here, it, each step in this reaction is reversible. So by adding more water, we should be able to regenerate our starting ketone. By removing water, we can generate our acetal. Does that answer your question? Okay. Sorry if I didn't see that quick enough. Okay, so in this case here, uh, we are in another reversible reaction, just like with the uh, forming of the imine, I'm sorry, the forming of the uh, acetal. But in this case, we're using nitrogen to do the work and it has to have two hydrogens on it so that it can remove water. But again, this is a reversible reaction. So if you don't remove the water, it'll go so far and stop. But if you wanna regenerate your carbonyl compound, all you have to do is add water and a little bit of acid it'll shift the equilibrium the other way. But the key here is you have to have a nitrogen with two hydrogens on it so you can generate that water. Okay, so how does this work? Well, we have the lone pair on nitrogen act as a nucleophile, okay? When the lone pair on nitrogen acts as a nucleophile, it'll generate an intermediate where we have a positive charge on nitrogen and a negative charge on the oxygen. And what it'll do is it'll transfer one of the protons from the nitrogen to the oxygen, giving us an alcohol. So this gives us our tetrahedral MF. And again, this is reversible. The next thing that happens is we use the acid to protonate the alcohol. When we protonate the alcohol, we got the oxonium ion, which is a good leaving group. And then the lone pair can come in from oh, then the Sigma bond between this uh, hydrogen and this nitrogen can come in and form our second bond, kicking out our neutral water. And notice we have this water acting as a base. That water is starting to pull on that hydrogen. And so the electrons kick in between the oxygen, I mean, the carbon and the nitrogen, giving us our imine. Okay. And again, each step is reversible. So if we don't remove the water as we progress, we'll actually get all the way back to our carbonyl compound. Okay, so why do we care about that? Well, this is a common reaction that's actually used a lot in the body where it can take that carbonyl compound, react it with some kind of amino compound and generate this uh, material. Now, in the case of uh, this particular aldehyde, this is retinal, 
This is a pale yellow right there. But by converting it with this amine group here, we actually get a, a really vibrant purple color out of it. Because now we have um, a different group here and it makes it, it, this is actually conjugated all the way through. And that gives rise to a really bright color. In fact, a lot of uh, organic dyes use this trick of having conjugation and different types of groups pulling and pushing electrons back and forth to generate color. Okay, so the other cool thing it does is we can actually then form amines, secondary amines, very readily this way because once we form that imine, it's got a carbon a nitrogen double bond, and we can add hydrogen across that carbon nitrogen double bond and we'll generate a secondary amine in this case, or we can generate a primary amine if we used ammonia. If we used ammonia, we would have, uh, no, not that, sorry. That wasn't even a hexagon. If we used ammonia, we would generate this amine here. And if we added hydrogen across that double bond, we'd end up with a primary amine. Remember, it's hard to make a primary amine with an alkyl halide because it's still nucleophilic and will keep reacting and reacting and reacting. So this is a very clean way to make a primary and secondary amine. It stops exactly where you want it and it can be symmetrical or unsymmetrical if you want. It all depends on what you choose as your amine and what you choose as your ketone or alkyl. Okay, so that's another useful uh, thing to do with an amine. You can convert it into an amine. Okay. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit. Okay, we've looked at the carbonyl compound. We know it's polar. Okay, we can attack it with nucleophiles and make these new products, either alcohols or or, or um, um, acetals or hemiacetals or uh, the amines, right? Well, what else can we do with these aldehydes and ketones? Well, it turns out because of the nature of, the, of a resonance structure capability, we actually have an additional reaction that we haven't seen before that happens with aldehydes and ketones, okay? So what this is, is it's called Keto enol tautomerism. Okay. So if you remember, keto is a ketone. So we have the ketone form of the system. But then we have the enol. The enol, that's an alcohol and an alkene. Okay. So it can go back and forth between the two by just transferring one hydrogen from the carbon next to the carbonyl to the oxygen of the carbonyl. Okay. So why do we care? Okay, well, because if we look at this, this compound is going to react like a ketone with a carbonyl. This compound is going to react as an alkene or an alcohol. So that means that if it's flipping back and forth, we have to be very careful about which form we want to react with. Do we want to react to the double bond between the carbons, or do we want to react to the double bond between the oxygen and the carbon? So how do we know it exists? Well, we know it exists because people notice that, hey, this other reaction is happening here. I don't know why it's happening because it's acting like an alkene or it's acting like an alcohol, but I have a ketone. So this is where they discovered the idea that it will happen in the, in the presence of either acid or base, but there's an equilibrium, okay? So let's look at that. In the case of uh, this acid aldehyde here, the keto form is where it has the carbonyl structure. The enol form is where it has the double bond and the oxygen, the uh, alcohol. And if we look at the equilibrium constant here, it is six times 10 to the negative five, meaning it's mostly here, but there's enough of it that they can detect it. And there's enough of it that this can react if you have a very good reaction, a very fast reaction. But notice with just acetone, we also have about 10 to the minus six 
So it's a little more shifted toward the ketone, but we have enough of it in this form, it can react as an alcohol, okay? And when we have the rings, the, uh, the shift gets a little bit bigger, okay? So the keto form, the carbonyl form will always predominate, but the fact that it can undergo this enol keto tautomerism means that we can see other reactions happen in fact, we can influence other reactions to happen instead of reacting it as a carbonyl compound. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is convince ourselves that we can do eno ketotomerism. All right, and so let's see what what is more stable: a alkene with two substituents on it, or an alkene with three substituents on it. We talked about, you know, one being more stable than the other. And when we look at stability of alkenes, we want to have the highest number of substitutions possible. That makes them more thermodynamically stable. Now, the reason I bring this up is we have two choices. Okay. In this structure here, we can either form our alkene here and our alcohol up here, or our alkene here and our alcohol up here. At least the alcohol stays in the same place, right? So in this case, it's gonna form the more stable alkene. So our enol form, it's gonna have our double bond there and our alcohol here. And they're of course gonna be in equilibrium, mostly in the keto form, mostly in the carbonyl form. Same thing's gonna happen with this one. We have a choice, but because this alkene is gonna be more substituted, we will see the alkene form, the, uh, the enol form having the double bond on the more substituted side. Okay. So what if we already have an enol? Let's convert it back to the ketone, okay? So in this case here, we have this weird thing here now, whenever we have the enol form and we want to go back to the ketone, the OH that is bonded to that double bond, that's where the carbonyl ends up, okay? And in this case, we have a hydrogen here. And if this turns into a carbonyl, that means we're going to have a carbonyl with a hydrogen, meaning we're going to get an aldehyde, okay? We have our hydrogen here. That's not the one that's going to move. This is the hydrogen that's going to move over here. So that means that we're going to have our ketone, our, our carbonyl compound over here, and we're in an, an aldehyde. Do you see why the oxygen that has the OH on it is the one that's going to become the carbonyl compound when it goes back to the keto form? Okay. So, and we're just going to pick one of these because what's going to happen is we're going to end up with our double bond back here. Then the hydrogen goes to the other side of that double bond to get back to our keto form. So we're going to have OOH because it can't do both. It can only do one or the other. And then that hydrogen goes here. So we go back to um, the ketone form, keto form. Let's do this last one here. Again, this is the one that's going to become the carbonyl. So let's not and then the hydrogen is going to go over here. So we still keep a double bond. And we end up generating our carbonyl there and our hydrogen there. Okay, so it's an equilibrium. It mostly stays in the carbonyl form. But what if it was in the enol form for just a little while? Okay. So Predominantly, we use acid or base to kind of catalyze this because we need to move that hydrogen away. And so one of the ways to do that is with acid catalysis. In acid catalysis, the first thing we're going to do is always add a proton. And in our ketone, the only place we can add a proton is the lone pair of the oxygen on the carbon. Okay, so that'll be our first step. And then we're getting this uh, charged species here. And we have our new conjugate base. Okay. The next thing that can happen is our new conjugate base is going to pull a proton 
off of the carbon next to the carbon. Okay. So when it does that, you end up going to the eno, the keep enol form right here, and we've regenerated our acid. Again, each of these steps is equilibrium, and therefore it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. One of the things that makes it a problem is when it goes back and forth, back and forth, it is not stereospecific. Okay. Which means if you had a jar of pure material here, we have one group here, one group here, one group here, and one group here. So that means we have this as our chiral carbon. Okay. If we had enantiomer, if we had a pure version of this material and we kept it away from acid and we kept it away from base, it would stay this pure material because it cannot undergo the eno ketoptomerism without an acid or base catalyst. But if we put one drop of acid in this thing, what it's going to do is it's going to flip back and forth between its, its eno form right here and its keto form, okay? But there's no telling where the hydrogen is going to come to, from the top or the bottom. And when it comes from the top, you'll regenerate your S isomer. But if it came from the bottom, you actually generate the other isomer, okay? So you end up mixing up your stereocenter with just one drop of acid. That's another way we know that the eno ketoptomerism works is we can start with a very pure chiral compound and end up with a mixture of two uh, of the uh, enantiomers. Okay, questions on that? Only got a few minutes left, let's power through. Okay. All right. And so the other cool thing that tells us we have eno ketotetomerism is the idea that we'll actually, we can actually hydro, we can actually add a halogen, not to the carbonyl, but one carbon over. Okay. So we can get a, a, a bromine or a chlorine is going to react with that hydrogen that's one over. So in our enol form, we, we are actually taking off one of these hydrogens. And it's, this is what we call the alpha carbon because it's right next to the carbonyl. When the enol, when the base or acid pulls off this right here, we can end up with a halogen adding to that alpha carbon instead of having the hydrogen add back. Okay, and that's what we call, um, it would be an alpha halo aldehyde or ketone. So it's adding a halogen, one carbon over from the carbonyl. This is another th reason that we know that enocotomerism works because if you just added bromine to a ketone, nothing would happen. Uh, but if you added bromine to a ketone with some acid or base, it will it'll halogenate next to the carbonyl. The carbonyl stays untouched. Okay, so how does that work? Well, we know that a halogen will add to alkenes, the halogen will react with an alkene, okay, to form that uh, intermediate species that, with the with the the bromonium cation here. And in that case, what we have is the keto form, completely inactive with bromine, doesn't do a thing. But in the enol form, our alkene can now reach out as our electrophile and create a new bond with the bromine right here and leaving our carbonyl compound protonated. This is now our new conjugate base. It pulls off this proton and generates our neutral ketone with our hydrogen alpha to it. Okay. So that's a really cool reaction, but it also drives home the idea that only the enol form would have reacted with bromine. And since the enol form and the keto form are in equilibrium, all you need is a little bit of that enol reacting with the bromine slowly, and then eventually all of it reacts to form the bromo compound. Okay. So now that we have a bromine 
alpha to that carbonyl, it's more reactive to nucleophilic attack than the carbonyl itself. So how can we use that to our advantage? Well, we can use that to make really interesting materials. If we'd attacked our carbonyl with, a, uh, with an amine before, we would actually see it react. In this case, we're attacking it with a, a secondary amine, so it doesn't have two hydrogens, so it can't form an amine, but it can act as a nucleophile. In this case, the lone pair will come in and displace the bromine, giving us our new functionalized compound. By adding the bromine there, it gives us a way to functionalize at that alpha carbon, that carbon next to the carbon. Okay, questions on that? I think I actually wanna do oxidation uh, next time we meet. So um, I'm going to stop right here at that, okay? Um, so if you wanna stay back and ask questions, please do. If you don't, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. And then we can uh, continue this on Tuesday. Uh.